Ah, uh, there we go. The last time I ran sound, I did the same thing. <laughs> All right. Hey. Now we're on. OK. Well, my name's still Vicar Brandon, but now you can hear it. And that's Pastor Kale. And uh, we're uh, excited that you guys are here joining us, whether in person or you're streaming us online or watching afterwards. Thanks for worshiping with us. Uh, this is our, taking our first midweek uh, service because we checked on it this week. And last week doesn't count because it's past Wednesday. So midweek one is today, and uh, we're continuing on in our sermon series, uh, going, learning more about the, the depth of God's love for us. So today we'll be looking at uh, the depth of God's love as shown through his provision. Uh, with that, we'll begin with our opening song. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and repents of evil. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself. Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Amen. We continue our hymn.
Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear, read, mark, learn, and take them to the heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel for this evening is the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We continue with our confession of faith in the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Please be seated.
seated. In the name of Jesus, whose heavenly Father loves us as his children, feeds us, clothes us, and has blessing upon blessing. Amen. Just how big is God's love? One of the favorite questions I used to ask when I would do uh, children's messages or children's church as a DCE. How big is God's love? So I want us all to, to think of something. All right? Go ahead. Think of something big. How many thought of an elephant? All right? That was a pretty common answer that I would get. Still too small. Or a blue whale. All right? The blue whale, the largest mammal, 100 feet long still too small. God's love is bigger. Or a a cruise ship, a a mountain, the whole earth, the entire universe, still too small. I mean, according to the most recent scientific estimates, or guesstimates, I guess, I think the universe is 93 million light years in diameter. To get from the, the, the farthest point that we can see to the other farthest point that we can see, 93 million light mirrors. That means if if you have a light on the one side and you travel at the speed of light, which is rather fast, it would take you 93 million years to get to the other side. Still not big enough. Genesis tells us that God is the one who created everything within those 93 million light years. He created the heavens and the earth I mean, on the fourth day of creation, he put our sun in the heavens. He put our moon and all the stars. And he put them there to shine light on your world, to mark your days and your years, your times and your seasons. He put them there so that they can declare to you God's glory, his power, his wisdom. And yes, his love. Every good thing in this creation flows from the love of God. The roof over your head and the pillow under your head. And the vitamins and minerals that nourish you. The vaccines and medicines that protect you. The stream with the sunshine gleaming on its waters. The majestic mountains. The crops growing in the field. The trees that are flowering in the spring. Sunsets with all their variety of colors and beauty. All of it. The whole world. The entire universe around you is full of wonder and beauty and delight. Because God provided it for you as a gift of love. That's what God does. God provides out of love. And the depth of his love can be shown not just that he created because he didn't just step back from his creation. No, God continues to be active in this world. He continues to provide. And your heavenly Father loves you and he will take care of you. And that's the heart of our reading for today from Matthew chapter 6. God didn't just create and then step back and think, oh, I wonder how this all is going to go. No, God is active and living in his creation. He richly and daily provides you with all that you need to support this body and life. See, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus makes this point by talking about two things. He talks about birds and he talks about flowers. Now, I grew up in this city So there's a lot about farming that I don't know. Uh, But I think I do understand what Jesus is talking here about the birds. He said the birds neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And based on my farming experience, I think that's true. I've never seen a bird out in the field driving a tractor. I've never seen a bird planting wheat. I mean, other than foghorn, leghorn, I don't think I've seen the Looney Tunes character, by the way. I don't think I've ever seen a bird even working in a field. You don't see them unloading grain, driving their big red or green tractor, depending on which company you support. 
Birds don't do that. Birds can't do that. They neither gather into barns, they neither sow nor reap, but they still have food to eat because God feeds them. And then Jesus talks about the, the lilies, right? He says that they neither toil nor spin. And, and in saying that, he invites us to imagine it. I mean, have you ever seen a bunch of lilies sitting around picking out seeds and cotton or combing flax? I, I, I actually haven't seen flowers doing much work at all. You ever see lilies operating a spinning wheel or making yarn or cotton thread? Any of you guys gone to Old Navy or Kohl's and seen a bunch of lilies sitting there waiting to get their next set of clothing? No, because they only had a 15% coupon and you've got to wait for the 30. That's how Kohl's works. No, the, flowers don't do that. Flowers can't do that. And yet, Jesus says they're still dressed beautifully. I mean, in fact, a single blooming flower is more beautiful than a movie star and and as glorious as a king because God dresses them. God takes care of them. Jesus' point is that if birds are fed by God, if the flowers are dressed by God, how much more will your heavenly Father take care of you? So you are worth more to him than the graceful birds, than the delicate flowers. God says you're more valuable. God loves you. And every good thing in his creation is a gift from his hand. It flows to you out of his fatherly divine good and mer- goodness and mercy. As James writes in James chapter 1, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights. If God provides for the birds and for the flowers, how much more will he take care of you? See, Jesus actually uses a similar argument in Luke chapter 11 uh, to, to assure that everything that we need we can seek from God. He says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is saying that the Heavenly Father's love for you is even greater than the love of an earthly parent for their child. I mean, think about that. How many people that when they experience the birth of their child or that they're holding a newborn or as their kids grow up, they say, I never experienced love. I never knew love until I had a child. God's love is far deeper than that. I mean, because every earthly father and mother is imperfect, perhaps even deeply flawed, if we're honest. But imperfect though they are. I mean, think about the strong, strong love of a parent for the child. I mean, the joy that they find in helping them, even when they maybe don't want to. And the pain they feel when their child feels pain, when their child suffers or struggles. I mean, parents working long hours to provide, to feed, to clothe, to care, to protect. Even though sometimes, I mean, oftentimes, maybe all the times, it drains them of all their energy, still provide, still love their children. And Jesus tells us that God the Father loves you far more than even this because he gives you the love of a perfect Father. Jesus says something also in in this Luke passage is rather remarkable, and I think we probably, most of us probably overlooked it when I just read it. He said, what father among you, if your son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The section that we might have overlooked the first time is Jesus t- tells us, you who are evil, 
it's almost an offhand comment in the midst of a whole section that's about God's love for us. But he says it, you who are evil. I mean, who is this heavenly Father who provides for us? He's the God and Father full of goodness and love. And who are the children who receive that love and that provision? We are evil. We are evil, Jesus says. And yet he assures us that God will provide not only earthly gifts, but also the greater gifts, his Holy Spirit, his forgiveness, his kingdom. And he gives so many gifts, such great gifts, and he gives them to sinners. People who can't earn or deserve them. I mean, is it any wonder that St. John writes in 1 John 4, God is love. When we see the depth of God's provision, his provision for sinners, sinners who live in active rebellion to him, sinners who can't earn the provision, sinners who certainly don't deserve it, sinners like you and like me, when we see the depth of God's provision for us, we begin to understand the depth of his love for us. See, though we are sinners, though there's no merit or worthiness in us, God keeps giving. But what about those times where it seems like he isn't providing? When it looks like God is hands off with the world? What about all the pain and and the tragedy that we see? Pandemics and illnesses, scarcity and famine, Poverty, war, and people who suffer unthinkable things at the hands of others. I mean, can God's love for us really be so big if we're honest about all of that? The answer is yes. His love for us is really that enormous, that deep, real, perfect, fatherly love. I mean, he's the potter and we are the clay. He's the father, we are children. Beloved children. But still children. I mean, there are many things about the way that God governs this world that we cannot possibly understand. I mean, why does the God who so loves us, who cares for us so richly, allow us? such hard things to come, allow such evil things to happen. It's a great mystery that we can't even begin to explain. So what we do is we leave the answers to things that we can't understand. We leave that in the hands of our Heavenly Father. The hands who provide for us what we need. The hands who reach down into the depth of our sin and give us grace. We leave those answers in the hands of the God who is never hands off with this world. He's never standing back, watching from a distance. He hasn't lost sight of what's going on in creation, and he hasn't lost sight of what's going on in your life. See, when it seems like God is hands off in your life, when it seems like no one's in control, when he's not providing for you, Remember that through Jesus' suffering and death on your behalf, Christ won for you a place in the Father's heart. See, when we see the goodness and the blessing that God provides in abundance through his creation, we also have to see that those things, those same gifts of the Creator, were turned against the Creator against Jesus. Wood from a lofty green tree that God created was fashioned into a cross of his death. Or from the hills that he formed was hammered into spikes and a spear that pierced your Savior. Animal's hide was tanned and cut into strips to form the whip that scourged our Lord and tore open his skin. A thorny plant was dried and twisted into a cruel crown they pressed into his brow. 
when God first set the hills into place, when he formed the rock, he knew that one of those stones would close the tomb of his dead and bloodied son. And yet he did it all for you so that you would be his child, so that you would be forgiven. I mean, the greatest mystery is not why God allows tears and pains in our lives. A far greater mystery is why he would love us and give us good things. And yet that's what he does. Even though we can't understand it, even though we can never explain it, God still loves he loves and cares for us for Jesus' sake. I mean, for, for Jesus bore our sins on the cross that we would share in his sonship. We would become a part of the family of God. We would be with Jesus in the Father's heart. Because of Jesus, our Heavenly Father deals with us in enormous love. He richly and daily supplies us with what we need. He protects us. He surrounds us with beauty. I'm reminded of the poem, Footprints in the Sand. Perhaps you've heard of it before. I mean, it tells of someone uh, describing their walk with God as a journey on the beach. And as they look back on that journey, they see that there's some times there where there's only one set of footprints in this walk with God. And they wonder about it. I, I've seen an alternate version of the poem that answers that question this way. It says, There was only one set of footprints because sand people walk single file to hide their numbers. It's a very specific Star Wars reference. But for the rest of us, here's the more familiar version of the poem. It says, When there was only one set of footprints... Here's God's response. My precious, precious child, I love you, and I would never, ever leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. See, when it seems like God is being hands-off in this world, seems like he's led us to go on our own, seems like he's abandoned us, you can be reassured that he's not. In fact, his hands, the same hands that were pierced for you, that were raised for you, are holding you, providing for you, saving you. And not just in the tough times, like the poem seems to suggest. No, God is holding you at all times, throughout the entire journey. He is constantly providing for you and pointing you to the day that those sorrows and those evils will be no more. Because Jesus has conquered sin and death and evil. He is making all things new. And one day, one day soon, he will come again. And he will dry every tear. And his everlasting kingdom will be a place of perfect provision, of perfect health, of perfect joy. Dear friends in Christ, May God grant us eyes to recognize his loving gifts in our daily lives. May we see the depth of love in his provision for us. And may God's fatherly love flow from us to others, flow through us as his provision is shared with his people. As we seek to provide for those who are in need, to protect those who are in danger, to create beauty and beautiful things in love, that we would be a people who respond to the provision of God, to the depth of God's love. Or as Luther puts it in the explanation of the first article, for all this, for all this, all that God has provided in His Son, Jesus Christ, all that He continues to provide as He is active and living in this world. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey Him. This is most certainly true. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
till the day he calls you home. Amen. We continue with prayer. Please rise. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and a pardon with all of our hearts and all of our minds, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> for those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have for all those in need, the hungry and the homeless, the widowed and the orphaned, for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick and the dying and all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and most merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn.